May we hear with our ears what is auspicious. May we see with our eyes what is auspicious. May we enjoy with strong limbs and bodies the life allotted to us. Om, peace, peace, peace. <clears throat> this morning's subject is Buddha. And it is extremely difficult to really say, to really manage to capture the greatness of Buddha. So the one thing that I try to do is to present some of the things that he taught and a little bit about his life. Before he was born, when uh, it was clear that a child would be born to her, then uh, soothsayers or astrologers were consulted and they were told that this child of yours that is to be born will either be a great emperor or he will renounce the world altogether and become a great renunciate, a great monk. So having been told that his father, the king, uh, made sure that he would never be confronted with anything that would urge him toward the path of renunciation, the path of the monastic life. So he was kept in the palace among great diversions and enjoyments. But as <laughs> one can try to forestall the uh, intentions of what you might call fate or karma or divine grace or divine will, whatever name you want to give to it, you're not able to succeed very long. Anyway, they tried. They tried to keep the, this young boy amused and uh, entertained and keep him away from all sorts of possibilities of having him renounce the kingdom and go in the wandering life in the, the spiritual direction. But one day, the prince, having grown up in luxury, wanted to find out what was outside this palace. He had been so carefully kept within those grounds. What is outside this palace? How does that differ from here? Why is it that I cannot go and uh, have a look at what is beyond? So he arranged with his faithful charioteer to uh, sometime when there was enough distraction, he would simply go out with the charioteer and drive through the city and look at what was out there. 
So in the course of this, this happened several times, in the course of this he saw four things, three of which upset him enormously. One, he saw a person who was very sick, could hardly move, in pain. And he had never seen such a person. Uh, his uh, father, following the prediction of the astrologers, had kept him away from all such things. So the prince asked his charioteer, is this an, an unusual situation? Is this this person who appears so, appears to be suffering, is this, is this a common thing? Does this happen? Is this known to happen? <laughs> or is it merely an exception? And the charioteer told him, well, no, Your Majesty, it is not, unfortunately, it is not an exception. This happens to human beings. They become sick and they suffer pain. And it is difficult for them to bear it, it is difficult for their relatives to see it, but this is the fate of human beings. Everyone has that possibility. And he saw a dead body on another occasion. He saw a dead body being carried to the cremation ground. Oh, what is this? Well, Your Highness, this person has passed away from life and uh, his uh, body will now be cremated. Oh, is this unusual, or is, is this something that could be expected for people in general, or is this something that happens only in, in an unusual situation? No, Your Highness, this is the fate of everyone. Sooner or later, this life ends and the body becomes uh, insensible, lifeless, and it is then destroyed. So in this way, the prince saw these various things that can happen in a person's life. And he was totally upset by this. He had never seen anything like that in his palace. He had been kept, all such things had been kept totally hidden from him. Three such he saw of suffering. And each time he asked, is this an unusual situation? No, oh, your highness, this is what happens or can happen to everyone. Then he saw a fourth, had a fourth <laughs> vision of a, a, a person who was calm, sedate, and who appeared to be intensely concentrated on an inner purpose, whose face was calm, whose face was blissful, who was not in uh, the condition of the people that he had seen who had been suffering. So he asked, who is this? And the chariot he had said, he is a monk. He has given up this world and is concentrating on the inner reality that is present in all beings. So having seen these visions, the prince Siddhartha decided that that was the way he had to go. 
He had to find an end, he had to find a reason, he had to find a cause for the misery that he had been able to see, even though he had seen only patches of it, he was fully impressed by the seriousness of it. And he uh, managed to arrange with his charioteer that they would on some occasion when everybody else was distracted, they would go and leave and, and the charioteer would leave him out to continue his way alone in the manner of the wandering monks of those days. And then he journeyed from where he was and uh, reached a place where there was some monks were gathered and he joined them. And uh, they, uh, he talked to them and uh, they, he asked them more about their life and their method of uh, that method of search for the inner meaning, the inner reality. And thus the uh, biography goes on. He became convinced that whatever happens in this outward realm is only a temporary solution. The permanent solution must be somewhere else. So he turned, since it wasn't outside, since the exterior was not the source of what he was looking for, he turned within and he sat down under a tree which has since been called the Bodhi tree. And he made this Vow, ihasane shushyatu me shariram. In this sitting here on this seat, may my shariram, may my body dry up. May my body dry up on this seat. Ihasane shushyatu me shariram. Tuagasti maamsam pralayan chayatu. The, my flesh and bones may all that dry up and be dissolved, be destroyed. Aprapya bodhim without attaining bodha, bodhi illumination. Aprapya bodhim bahukalpa durlava, which through many kalpas is difficult to attain. Naiva asanat from this seat. Kayam atashchalishyate. This body will not move from this seat until that knowledge is attained. That is the world famous determination of the Buddha. And with that determination and that concentration of mind to attain the source of knowledge, to attain the reality of things, to see to the very core of reality, not to be dis uh, disillusioned and disturbed by the surface, to see the heart of what is real. He sat and with a mind sharpened and concentrated, he beheld all the things of this world renounced them all, absorbed himself in that one inner, the inmost reality that he was looking for, and he attained that state of nirvana. Nirvana means the extinction of all that is not the reality, that all that is a distraction, all that is not the core of truth. 
So, this is the great inspiration that uh, Buddha gives to the world. That if our intention is serious enough, if our purpose is serious enough, it is possible to attain that which seems to be so difficult, so impossible under normal circumstances. And of course there are many uh, accounts of all this time and that he actually in the process he foresaw, he saw all of his past births and he saw that in all of them he had lived a noble, excellent existence, striving for that realization of that which is true, which is permanent, which is essential, and eventually that realization dawned on him. So then, now what is that message that he was trying to give? So, Swami Vivekananda gave a lecture called Buddha's Message to the World. And I will quote some of all this. Buddha cut through all the oppositions that he encountered. He preached the most tremendous truths. He taught the very gist of the philosophy of the Vedas to one and all without distinction. He taught it to the world at large because one of his great teachings was the equality of all beings. All human beings are equal no concession there to anyone. Buddha was the great preacher of equality. Every man and woman has the same right to attain spirituality. That was his teaching. The difference between the priests and the other castes he abolished. Even the lowest were entitled to the highest attainment. What was his doctrine? What was it that he discovered? Continuing Swami Vivekananda's lecture, why is there misery in our life? Because we are selfish. We desire things for ourselves. That is why there is misery. What is the way out? The giving up of the self. The self as such does not exist. The phenomenal world, all this that we perceive, is all that exists. So, all selfishness comes from holding on to this, to this illusory self. If we know the truth that there is no intrinsic limit, there's no limited self, then we will be happy and make others happy. The technique was destroy all delusions. What is true will remain. As soon as the clouds are gone, the sun will shine. How to go beyond the self, become perfectly unselfish, ready to give up your life even for an ant. Work not for any superstition, not to please any god, not to get any reward, because you're seeking your own release. The religion of Buddha spread fast. It was because of the marvelous love which for the first time in the history of humanity overflowed a large heart and devoted itself to the service, not only of all human beings, but of all living things. 
a love which did not care for anything except to find a way of release from suffering for all beings. Man was loving God and had forgotten all about his brother man. The man who in the name of God can give up his very life can also turn around and kill his brother in the name of God. That was the state of the world. They would sacrifice the son for the glory of God, would rob nations for the glory of God, would kill thousands of beings for the glory of God, would drench the earth with blood for the glory of God. But this was the first time that they turned to the other God, man. It is man that is to be loved. It was the first wave of intense love for all men the first wave of true unadulterated wisdom that starting from India gradually inundated country after country, north, south, east, and west. You cannot really be happy when the rest of the world is suffering. We're all one. It is the delusion of separateness that is the root of misery. In order to arrive at this, it is interesting to look at the steps that the Buddha took in order to arrive at his understanding. First, we can describe what Buddha called the noble search. And he described it this way. Someone who being himself or herself subject to birth, having understood the danger in what is subject to birth, seeks the supreme security from bondage, nirvana. Being himself subject to aging, having understood the danger in what is subject to aging, he seeks the unaging supreme security from bondage, nirvana. You remember that the first visions that Buddha had, the first sights that he beheld when he went on his journey through the city with his charioteer were a, a person who was sick, a person who had died and was being body was being taken to the cremation ground, and a person who was old and feeble with age. The fourth vision that he saw was of a monk who was dedicated to achieving a solution to the problem of birth, sickness, old age, death. And this is the noble search. Someone being himself subject to birth, having understood the danger in what is subject to birth, seeks the unborn supreme security from bondage, nirvana. Being himself subject to aging, having understood the danger in what is subject to aging, he seeks the unaging supreme security from bondage, nirvana. Being himself subject to sickness, having understood the danger in what is subject to sickness, he seeks the unailing supreme security from bondage, nirvana. Being himself subject to death, having understood the danger in what is subject to death, he seeks the deathless supreme security from bondage, nirvana. Being himself subject to sorrow, having understood the danger in what is subject to sorrow, he seeks the sorrowless supreme security from bondage, nirvana. Being himself subject to defilement, having understood the danger in what is subject to defilement, 
He seeks the undefiled supreme security from bondage, nirvana. This is the noble search. And when he had tried all these various things, he, decided, he sat down under this tree, this famous Bodhi tree, and made this resolution. Ihasane shushyadu me shariram, in this, in this seat, in this asana, shushyadu, may my, twagasti mamsa, may my body, sharira, may my body dry up on this seat. Twagasti mamsa pralayan chayatu, twak the flesh, asti the bones, and all parts of my anatomy, may they be destroyed. Aprapya bodhim, without attaining illumination, bahukalpa durlabham, being difficult to attain even through many kalpas, many eons, naiva asanat from this seat, Kayam atashchalishyate, this body will not move from this seat. With that resolution, he sat. That is, these are the things that we have to learn from that. The, the resolution of attaining a solution to the problems of life and existence is not to be attained by a simple desire to read this or understand that. It is to be approached with that determination. Ihasana, in this asana, that doesn't necessarily mean a particular, of course he meant a particular posture, but we can understand it in a larger way, in this search, in this tremendous, dedicated, intense search in our life for that which is meaningful, for that which is eternal, for that which is reliable, for that which will not decay, and that intense desire has to be cultivated in such a way that even if everything else about us is destroyed because of it, that search must remain. Ihasane, in this asana, in this position, with this intention, shushya me sharira, may my body dry up on this seat. <laughs> you know, may it be completely dried and destroyed. Aprapya bodhim, without prapya, aprapya, not attaining, without attaining bodhim, without attaining illumination. Naiva asanat kayamatashchalishyate, this body will not move from this seat. That is one of the tremendous things that we have to learn from the glorious example of Buddha. It is through such intense concentration, such intense dedication, whatever it is that we have accepted as the, the path that we see ahead of us leading to realization, leading to understanding, leading to ultimate fulfillment, that has to be pursued with that type of intensity. <laughs> Just simply saying, oh, I think I, I would like to undertake these uh, disciplines, I would like to do this meditation, but there's so many other things we do that we can, that will not get us. This is the message of Buddha, that, he, that will not get us 
very far. Some progress there may be, some understanding may come. But without this infinite intensity, we cannot really expect very much. So as the Buddha tried, he went, he saw certain teachers, he went to certain teachers as he was searching, as he was undergoing all of his uh, practices, and uh, certain schools of thought he went to and tried to inquire of their adherents whether they had achieved, what is it that they had achieved, and uh, he himself tried to achieve according to their instructions. And uh, the first uh, attempt, there he went to a teacher and he asked him what is the way. The teacher was called Kalama. Friend Kalama, in what way do you declare that, that by realizing it for yourself with direct knowledge you enter upon and dwell in this search? in this dharma. So what is it? What is your method of practice? And uh, the reply that he got from this Arakalama, Kalama, the reply was nothingness. He is searching for nothingness. That nothingness is the answer that the, what is at the heart of everything, everything that changes, at the heart of everything is what you might say, the vacuum is nothingness. When one is absorbed in that, then that is the, uh, the uh, fulfillment. So he tried that. He tried this, the Buddha in his attempt tried to follow that discipline and he found that it did not work. It did not give his, uh, it did not end his, Search, he did not get, give meaning. So that was his first attempt. Then he went to another teacher and uh, having found no fulfillment, in the first attempt he went to another teacher and uh, he asked him, well, what is it that you practice? And the teacher replied, this dharma that I teach is such that a wise man can soon enter upon and dwell in it, himself directly realizing through direct knowledge his own teacher's doctrine. And the, the Buddha tried this, I, and his result was, I soon and quickly learned that particular dharma as far as mere lip reciting and rehearsal of this teaching went, I could speak with knowledge and assurance, and I claimed I know and I see. But then I considered. What is the... Uh, uh, so I, I considered that I had not achieved uh, ultimate satisfaction. So he went to various other spiritual teachers and tried their particular methods. Then, monks, being myself subject to the birth, Having understood the danger in what is subject to birth, seeking the, no, the unborn supreme security from bondage, nirvana, I attained the unborn supreme security of knowledge. That is when he said, Ihasane shushyatume shariram, let my body dry in this seat. Without attaining that ultimate realization, I will not leave this seat. And so with that determination, having thoroughly given up everything else, concentrating his mind totally in that way, he entered that state.
So what is it that we are to learn from this? This is what the, uh, what is it the, uh, that, that the Buddha actually taught? Having realized this, And he spoke to the, uh, he had, uh, for some time, he had been uh, in the company of other monks who were trying various other paths of realization. And uh, after he had found that path, after he had found, sat with that intention, and after he had uh, achieved that realization, he came to those monks with whom he had been associated previously, and he explained to them what he had found. O oh, monks, these two extremes should be followed, should not be followed by one who has gone forth into homelessness, that is, who has become a monk. What are these two? The pursuit of sensual happiness in sensual pleasures. What is low, vulgar, the way of worldings, ignoble, unbeneficial, and the pursuit of self-mortification, which is painful, ignoble, unbeneficial, should be, should be given up. Without veering toward either of these two extremes, the Tathagata, that means the Buddha, has awakened to the middle way, which gives rise to vision, which gives rise to knowledge, and leads to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to nirvana. And what, O oh monks, is the middle way awakened by the Buddha? It is this noble eightfold path that is right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness and right concentration. This monks is the middle way that has been awakened to by the Tathagata, by the Buddha, which gives rise to vision, which gives rise to knowledge and leads to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to nirvana. Now this, O oh monks, is the noble truth of suffering. Birth is suffering, aging is suffering, illness is suffering, death is suffering, union with what is displeasing is suffering, separation from what is pleasing is suffering. Not to get what one wants is suffering. In brief, the five aggregates subject to clinging are suffering. Now, O oh monks, is the noble path of the origin of suffering. It is this craving that leads to renewed existence accompanied by delight and lust. Seeking delight here and there, that is craving for sensual pleasures, craving for existence, craving for extermination. Now, O oh monks, is the noble truth of the cessation of suffering. It is the remainderless fading away and cessation of the same craving, the giving up and relinquishing of it, freedom from it, non-attachment. Now this, O oh monks, is the noble truth, is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. It is the noble eightfold path, which is Again, right intention, right speech, <clears throat> right view, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. This noble truth of suffering is to be fully understood. Thus, O oh monks, in regards to things unheard of before, there arose in me vision, knowledge, wisdom, penetration, and light. Whatever is subject to origination is also subject to cessation.
So Swami Vivekananda's comments on the teachings of Buddha Yet the vision of Buddha spread fast, the religion of Buddha spread fast. It was because of the marvelous love which for the first time in the history of humanity overflowed a large heart and devoted itself to the service not only of all human beings, but of all living things. A love which did not care for anything except to find a way of release from suffering from all beings. This was the first time they had turned to the other god, man. It is man that is human beings that is to be loved. It was the first wave of intense love for all human beings. The first wave of true unadulterated wisdom that starting from India gradually inundated country after country north, south, east, or west. This teacher, Buddha, wanted to make truth shine as truth. No softening, no compromise, no pandering to the priests, the powerful, the kings. No bowing before superstitious traditions, however hoary. No respect for forms and books just because they came down from the distant path. He rejected all scriptures, all forms of religious practice, even the very language uh, in which religion had been traditionally taught in India, he rejected so that his followers would not have any chance to imbibe any superstitions associated that could be associated with it. Then Swami Vivekananda continues, in this lecture, there is another way of looking at this truth that we have been discussing, the Hindu way. We claim that Buddha's great doctrine of selflessness can be better understood if it is looked at in this way. In the Upanishads, there is already the great doctrine of the Atman and Brahman. The Atman, the self, is the same as Brahman. The self is all that is, it is the only reality. Maya delusion makes us see it as different. There is one self, not many. That one self shines in various forms. A man is another man's brother because all men are one. A man is not only my brother, say the Vedas, he is myself. Hurting any part of the universe, I only hurt myself. I am the universe. It is a delusion that I think I am Mr. So-and-so or Miss So-and-so. That is the delusion. The more you approach your real self, the more this delusion vanishes. The more all differences and divisions disappear, the more you realize all as the one divinity. God exists, but he is not the person sitting upon a cloud. He is pure spirit. Where does he reside? Nearer to you than your very self. He is the soul. How can you perceive God as separate and different from yourself? When you think of God as someone separate from yourself, you do not know God. He is you yourself. That was the doctrine of the prophets of India. subject for next Sunday is Shankaracharya. Child care is provided during our Sunday services. On Sunday evenings, normally Swami Tattva Mayananda holds an online class at 6 p.m. 
on the foundational texts of Indian philosophy. There will be no classes in April. The class will resume May 5th. On Wednesday evenings, we have Vespers with meditation at 7.30 p.m. in this auditorium. On Friday evening, Swami Tattva holds a scripture class at the Old Temple at 7.30 p.m. There will be no classes in April. The class will resume on May 3rd. You and your friends are cordially invited to attend all of our services. After the lecture, there will be a question and answer session in Vivekananda Hall, and all are welcome. Be 
समू ध्वन मोमिवस्व समूद्वे दीतिष्ठे भुवना विश्व उतामुंदमो पश्मी अहमे बबात इव पबा नुवना विश्व कवो दीपाव The subject for next Sunday is Shankaracharya. Child care is provided during our Sunday lectures. On Sunday evening, Swami Tattvamayananda normally holds an online class at 6 p.m. on the foundational texts of Indian philosophy. But there will be no classes in April. The class will resume on May 5th. On Wednesday evenings, we have vespers with meditation at 7:30 p.m. in this auditorium. On Friday evenings, Swami Tatvamayananda normally holds a scripture class at the Old Temple at 7:30 p.m. There will be no classes, however, in April. The class will resume on May 3. You and your friends are cordially invited to attend all of our services. After the lecture, there will be a question and answer session in Vivekananda Hall, and all are welcome. Om Jyo Shanti. अंतरिक्षम शांति पृथ्वी शांति आपशाति रोषरय शांति वनस्पत शांति विश्व देवा शांति ब्रह्म शांति सर्व शांति 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 ओम शांति 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 ओम पीस इज इन हेवन पीस इज इन द स्काय ऑन द अर्थ एंड इन द वॉटर्स द अर्ब्स द प्लांट्स एंड द ट्रीज आर फुल ऑफ पीस द गॉड्स आर पीसफुल everything in the universe is pervaded by peace may that infinite universal peace enter our soul and being oh peace 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 be unto us all